and you didn't tell us John Sales was going to be with us. It was a last minute surprise. And John, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to see you. Yeah, no problem. And uh, John, I'll bring you in. We have a few uh, housekeeping things to take care of, and then I will pull you in. It's, it's wonderful to have you. Okay, so hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's edition of The Great Movies, a discussion of The Secret of Ron Inish from 1994, directed by John Sayles. My name is Andy Wolverton, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by my guest partner in crime, Colin Chapel. Darnese is on vacation, but we'll be back with us next time. Darnese, Colin, and I are all librarians in the Anne Arundel County, Maryland Public Library System, which along with the Library Foundation sponsors this program. Our next virtual meeting will be on Friday, October the 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern, when we will discuss The Lighthouse from 2019, starring Robert Pattinson, and Willem Dafoe, whom we last saw in the Florida Project a few months ago. But this is a very different Willem Dafoe role, as we shall see. And signups for that begin on September 22nd. Let me also put that in the chat for you so you can bookmark that. And again, you can watch that on Canopy at any time, but we'll be talking about it on October the 6th. Okay, so if you're new to our discussions, we're so glad to have you along. And if you'd like to join our email list, you can send me an email at awolverton at aacpl.net. And that way you will get the news on everything that we are up to here. And please know that we want as many of you participating tonight as possible. So if you have a question or a comment, please raise your real hand or your virtual hand or you can use the chat feature and Colin will work you into the conversation. We also ask that you please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Okay, I think that is it. Do we have any questions? Okay, since there are no questions, um, I didn't have anything formal ready, John, to introduce you. So I'm just gonna introduce you as John Sales, the director of The Secret of Roan Inish and many, many other films. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure, uh, let me tell you a little bit how this movie came up, came about. Uh, Maggie Renzi, my partner and one of the producers on this movie, um, had read a book when she was a kid called The Secret of Ron Moore Scary, uh, which was beautifully illustrated by the author. Um, and uh, she had been uh, a coast watcher in Scotland during World War II with binoculars looking for German submarines. And she never saw any um, submarines, but she did see a lot of seals. And she asked the local people, because it was a, a summer house, um, are there any stories about the seals? And in both Scots and Irish um, folklore, there, there are these Selkie stories um, about almost always a woman who can turn herself into a human and then back into a seal. Or, you know, if if she can find her coat, she can turn herself back into a seal. And um, she kept bugging me that she would loved this book when she was a kid. She went back to her hometown and there was a library sale. They were getting rid of books. And there was the book um, for 25 cents. So we always say, you know, we, we got the rights to the movie for for the intellectual property for 25 cents. We also ended up paying uh, the author some money for it. Um, and I was so much more familiar at that time with Irish writing and folklore than Scots that I, I said it in Ireland. The same seals visit both places um, and uh, wrote a screenplay and we somehow finagled financing. It was, it was not easy and, and, and after the fact, not pleasant because one of the companies really were amateurs. Um, but we got to go to Ireland and, and make the movie. We, we brought very few people. Um, we brought our cinematographer and he brought a lot of equipment, Haskell Wexler, who had a lot of equipment. And uh, when I saw that he had, had brought um, 83 boxes of equipment. I said, 
Pascal were going to use every bit of that equipment. And I think we did. Every little gimmick that he had, we, we, we used. Um, and then the rest of it were Irish crew and Scots crew and English crew. Um, at one point, somebody said, this is the first time I've ever worked on a mixed crew. And we were thinking like, there are no black people on this crew, uh, which we often have back at home. And they said, oh no, you've got Irish from the North and the South. And uh, that was the first time actually that people from those two very separate industries at that time had worked together. Um, and they got along so well that they continued to do it, which was a nice thing to have, have left behind. Um, we got some not trained, but uh, accustomed to human seals mm -hmm. from uh, some people in Skegness on the, the British coast who were saving orphaned seals and uh, feeding them up to the point where they needed to go back into the wild. And then they would stick them in a giant swimming pool and throw fish in there and, and until they learned how to catch fish. Um, and uh, then they would release them. We were getting uh, three of them just before they were released. So they were used to being around people. They had these carrying cages. They, they were very comfortable. That was kind of their, their safe place. Um, and we asked those people to habituate the seals to do one or two things. One was to eat off of a food off of a shell on the ground. Seals, if they if they drop something in the sand, they don't pick it up. They don't have dentists, so they don't want to you know mess up their teeth eating food that's had sand on it. So they they're very uncomfortable actually eating something when they're not in the water. So they did that little bit of training, and then they they had already trained them to to nudge your leg if they wanted food. And so they had that thing where they would flop up to you and, and nudge you. Uh, I have to tell you that most of the SEAL movies that you've seen, if you've seen SEAL movies, uh, they're actually sea lions. Um, so, you know, Andre the SEAL is, is a fake. He's actually a sea lion, which have longer, um, you know, arms and can do things like balance on a great big beach ball or something like we were working with faucet seals which kind of flop around so they're not that mobile when they're on land um and really they were a, a joy to work with we just couldn't put them in the open sea because they might wander away and they really didn't know how to survive there so when we work with them in the sea we had to have giant nets um and shoot in a place that there were some big rock formations that we could close off with nets so that when the tide went out, we had our seals on land and they were there to work with another day. Wow, wow. Um, that's just amazing stuff because one of the questions I had was how in the world did you get the seals to, I mean, they, they seemed like they were just seal actors because they, they reacted exactly the way you would think a human would in, under the circumstances with all of the appearances and with Fiona, uh, it was just amazing. Yeah, they they are uh, supplemented here and there with animatronic seals. Um, there's a couple scenes where the heads bob up, and those are actually things that we called the bobs that were done with, you know, kind of the top of a seal float that you know had some pulleys and rope connected to them, so you could just say number three, and number three's head would bob up and then go down. Um, but uh, a lot of it's just patience on the part of the um, camera crew. Every Saturday, uh, we work with just animals, no sound, no actors. Occasionally, we'd have uh, Jenny, our little girl, in a boat or something. And the thing is, a seal can go under for 20 to 25 minutes before, even though it's a mammal, it has to come up for a breath. So sometimes you would get sort of a shot. And then you'd be in the boat with a camera, hoping that it came up on the side that you were pointing at. Um, seals are very curious. So if you want it to look somewhere, uh, you would blat a horn or open an umbrella or have a barking dog and they get bored very quickly. So you have to have a different sound or a different distraction every time if you want them to actually 
look somewhere. So it, it took some, some tricky stuff. Um, the toughest shot um, at the end when they chased the, the, uh, the little boy up from the sea, um, actually that was the first time we let them out of their cages and let them see the open ocean, what they thought was the ocean, open ocean. O open ocean. They didn't see the net because it was just under the, the surface. And they are actually flopping down toward um, the water instead of away from it. And we just told our little boy who just, you know, don't let them catch you back up, but don't let them catch you. Um, so it looks like they're chasing him. He's actually just backing up in front of them. And we tilted the camera. So it looks like they're going uphill instead of downhill. Hmm. Um, so, you know, every once in a while you had to fudge something, but having real wild seals instead of trained seals has kind of its own magic. Um, but it, it took, definitely took some kind of the, the patience, those people from National Ge Geographic who sit around for a week waiting for one shot. You know, you have to have that kind of patience when you're working with wild animals. Wow. Wow. And that's an incredible sequence there at the end. Just it just is so powerful. Well, John, I want to ask you a couple of questions, and then I'm going to open it up to the group. Um, I, I read quite a bit of the the interview book that um, that came out several years ago, and this is a tremendous book. But in the book, you talk a little bit about uh, directors being typecast just the same way as actors are typecast, and that each of your movies that came out people would say, well, this is a real departure for you. And then the next one would come out and they would say, this is a real departure for you. And in a way, this film was a real departure for you. But I wanted to ask you about how you made such a balance because so many people have said that, especially uh, your earlier films up to this point were filled with realism. Mm -hmm. yet, yet this film is filled with realism and with either fantasy or whether you wanna call it magic realism. How did how did you strike that balance? And especially working with Pascal Wexler, how did you guys work together to strike that balance? Yeah, I, I, you know, so, some of the the philosophy behind it was to have it be Irish magical realism. And the whole point of magical realism is uh, you're really thinking about what people really do, but some things that really couldn't happen, happen. Um, you know, if you think of... Uh, 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 Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who was kind of the writer who started, you know, Latin American uh, magical realism. Um, people might be able to levitate, but um, they're still poor. <laughs> right. They still can't avoid their fate. You know, the, the things that happen in real life still happen to them. So it's not a very useful kind of power that they have, just these, these crazy things happen that kind of tell you about just how strange this world can be. Um, so what one of the things that I wanted was uh, these two kids, um, Fiona and her cousin, if they want to get Jamie back, they really have to work for it. And we see them working. It, it does they don't say a magic word or it's not Harry Potter in that, in that way. Um, it's not pure magic, which Harry Potter is and does a very good job of. It's okay we're going to have to roll our sleeves up and earn this, the trust of these animals to give this baby back to us. Um, so that part was, was just the kind of philosophy of how we're going to tell the story. Um, with Haskell, the, the main note that I gave him was, um, I need you to shoot this so that nature um, has an agenda. So it has a consciousness. So not just the seals, but the seagulls and the sky and the weather. You know, we're going, I'm going to edit this together and you're going to shoot it so that it seems like, oh, wait a minute. Um, all of nature is conspiring to watch these kids and then decide they've earned this right. We're going to give this kid back. And in, in fact, we're going to throw him into their lap so he can't really come back. You know, we're going to drive him back to the humans where he really belongs. Yeah. Uh, so there's one shot where um, in the in the kind of uh, scene without any dialogue, uh, that's the flashback to how the baby floated away and and was taken because 
they didn't want these people to leave the island and they were going to take a hostage. Um, the captain of the, the little ship that's going to take everybody off the island looks up in the sky and it immediately kind of turns into storm weather. And that's basically, I just had said to Haskell, make it look menacing. And it's a, it's a ring on the camera. And he stopped down to the point where those nice looking clouds look like they're about to have an awful thunderstorm. Yeah. Another tremendous scene, just, yeah, just amazing. Well, I, I have one more question. Then I wanna turn it over to other people because I know they have some questions as well. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, I think one of the big themes in the film is being displaced and losing your identity. And after World War II, when, when the inhabitants of Roan Inish were taken away and the children have a strong desire to return back to that island, even though they're children, uh, they seem to be aware that this is where my identity is and we have to go back there. Can you talk about some of the decisions you made in the script about uh, that theme? Yeah, it, 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 it's something that you see in a lot of cultures. You know, we, we made a movie in West Virginia and uh, there are hill people from West Virginia and Kentucky, um, and they're in Chicago and they're in Cincinnati and, and boy, they miss home, even though they didn't have a job when they were home, especially when the, the coal you know, business kind of you know, went into the toilet. Um, you know, there are immigrants that I, I know who, you know, they're happy to be here, they're making a living, but they'd rather be home. You know, there, there, there's just that thing in you that feels like I'm not my my real self here. And and these kids just had enough of that island life um, that they felt like, well, this is second best what we're doing now. I know the adults have their reasons and kids often don't really want to look into those reasons or understand them. It's just like, why did we move? It was so great back there. Yeah. Um, so I wanted that pull and that you, you know, so many of our movies are about assimilation and that question of when you assimilate to a new place, whether it's a new country or you're, 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 you know, moving from high school into college or whatever, is what you're getting um, better than what you're giving up? Because you almost always have to give something up. Uh, you may have to uh, tell your kids, no, you're not learning how to speak Italian. You know, I want you to be an American. Um, and sometimes the next generation, the grandchildren say, how come we don't speak Italian? I'm going to go take classes or something crazy like that and talk to my grandparents. Yeah. No, I, I thought that was handled very, very well. Uh, one of the aspects of the film I really, really appreciated. Well, Colin, who do we have that wants to ask John a question or make a comment? Who's first? Um, Jeff, looks like Jeff has a question. Okay. And then Ed after that. So Jeff, go ahead. Um, thanks, Colin. Um, John, first of all, I'm a big fan of your stuff. Um, it's, it's really a thrill to have you on the show tonight. Um, what I wanted to ask you was, uh, rightly or wrongly, most of your films are, are American. Um, and I don't know whether you would say you're a, like a prototypical American director. But I, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is, I think, your only film that's not really set in America. I think Casa de los Babies is set somewhere down in Central America or something. Yeah, actually, but, there's, there's three or four. Is there? Um, okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. need to see uh, more uh, then. Okay. Amigo is set in the Philippines. There are okay. Americans in it. But, okay, uh, uh, corrected. Okay. But uh, I just wondered, um, like, what was it about this story? And, and was it a conscious... Um, thought to to move away from America for this story or you know I think I think the my my original attraction to it when I finally Maggie got me to read the book um I thought okay movie of this and it was a very simple story and I've only added a few a few you know more wrinkles to it um I I remember when I was a kid being a fan of the kind of um uh pre-Disney Haley Mills movies and um, we knew so many people with kids and there were at that time anyway, so few kids movies with a girl as a protagonist 
that that seemed like, oh, geez, you know, somebody should do this. Why don't we? Here's the perfect story to do it with. Um, to do the equivalent in America, uh, you'd have to go back almost another century. Whereas in Ireland and Scotland, um, right after the war, a bunch of islands, finally the packet boat people just said, we're not coming out there anymore. You know, three days out of four, the weather's too bad to come out. And it's just, it's just not paying. You know, whatever you people make or sell or whatever isn't worth it for us. So um, you're on your own and, but we'll, we'll make one last trip and everybody can get aboard and come in and find something to do on the mainland. Um, you know, that, that's not that common in American situation and certainly not, you know, in the 20th century. So I felt like, okay, this could have the feeling of something modern, but go way back. Um, I always said to, to the people who did the art, you know, department stuff is, you know, Jenny is a kid who has never seen a movie or a TV show. You know, she's lived in the wilds, even when she's on the mainland, of the part of Ireland where, you know, they're not even getting, maybe they're getting radio by now. Uh, but they certainly don't have television or a movie house. Um, so when she has flashbacks, this is just her imagination. This isn't her imagining what the movie would look like if you know this thing occurred in front of her. Um, so for me, the setting was a chance to go into kind of a, an interesting bubble where the realism and the mag magical part of it weren't quite so far apart. People are always going to the west of Ireland and saying, oh, it's magical. Well, yeah, it's magical until you read Riders to the Sea and everybody's drowning. Um, and, you know, that has its own magic, but it's also pretty, you know, grim and real. Okay, thank you. Uh, who do we have next, Colin? Um, Ed is up next and then Jan. Okay. So Ed, go ahead. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead and lower my hand. Um, well, I have a comment and then a question. But uh, so I had to look up the script because I I wanted to make sure I got it right. But um, I so there's this part where uh, the lady's talking about Jimmy have uh, meeting um, his soon to be wife, and he she says so there he is making honey in his heart of her good looks, and meanwhile she's just as struck. With him, a big, handsome, powerful lad with eyes that melted all the girls. And she's in a hundred pieces wondering what she could do to meet him. I, mean, I just thought that was golden. Um, the storytelling in this is just absolutely fabulous. And and that that was one of many that that stood out, you know, just almost, a, you know, the mythology uh, of it all is really, you know, really cool. Um, so the question I have... Um, and I don't know if, you know, you might have your favorites or not, but what is the favorite of yours that you have directed uh, and or written mm -hmm. uh, yourself? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I'll take that in two parts. First of all, the language is part of what attracted me to this. Um, I read a lot of the, the island writers from Ireland who um, wrote in Gaelic and then their stuff was later translated into English. Um, if you, you watch plays by Singh, who, who wrote uh, Writers to the Sea and Playboy of the Western World, he's talking about people who Gaelic is their first, you know, Irish is their first language, and they're just learning English. So their syntax is all over the place, but they're, they're coming from a really poetic language to one that, damn it, they're going to make it poetic. You know, kind of, kind of like Rastas do with Jamaican English, um, and and so I wanted to capture some of that, some of some of those those you know, kind of flights of fancy that they do with their their you know sometimes it's a literal translation from the Gaelic, and sometimes it's them being poetic. Um, and as far as my favorites, it's never the movie itself; it's the it's the situation. This was one one of my favorite ones. We got to go to Ireland. I'd never spent that much time there before. Um, I uh, got to work with all these really interesting people from a different film world. Um, you know, pretty much all of our crew were not American um, and see how they do things. 
Uh, I got to work with actors. I had no idea who they were until we got there and started casting. So we didn't have a single actor in mind when we started casting and we cast in London and just all these wonderful actors, some who we didn't cast who have come on, you know, to be, you know, famous Irish actors and, and others who, um, when our casting people, uh, somebody would come in and they'd be really, really kind of like, whoa, that was really Irish. They would write dog next to their name on their sheet. And I said, well, yeah, it wasn't that bad. And they say, oh no, that, that stands for Darby O'Gill. Um, because he's, he's trying to impress the Yanks by being even more Irish than he is. Um, so that was just fun. Uh, I'd say the other location and shoot that that we had such a good time on was uh, Mate One, which was shot in West Virginia. Uh, once again, we had an awful lot of local people in the cast. Some came and worked on our crew and just getting getting to know the people there and having them open up about their own stories, um, some of which got into the movie, um, was just a, you know, just kind of a, a nice way to spend time in a place and really meet a community. Um, and, you know, and then sometimes it's just a harder movie to make and you don't, you don't get to know the local people quite as much. Uh, road movies, you, you know, the last movie I made, we had like 60 look. 62 locations in 16 days and so you're you're only in it in one place maybe half a day so you don't really get to know who's there you get to know your own crew fairly well um but yeah it's it, it's the 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 experiences that i that i kind of like or feel like boy i survived that one <laughs> thank you thanks ed Okay, Colin, we have, who's up next? Um, Jan or Jan, I, I meant probably mispronouncing Willis is up next. That's okay. If I was in Europe, it would be Jan, but it's Jan. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't sure. Go That's ahead. It. Good to meet you, John. I love this film. I had not seen it in a couple of decades. Watched it a few weeks ago. One of my favorite endings of any film I've ever seen. It all comes together emotionally. I'm a wreck by the end of it in the best way. And part of it is um, Mason Daring's score, which I think is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm a children's librarian. I've been a librarian my whole life. I've been working with children at a school for the past 12 years. I'm going to be buying this book since it's back in print oh, for, for my kids. I want my kids to read this. I think of kids nowadays and all the competition we have with video games, but my kids love to read and they love stories. And I think my kids are an audience for this film. Mm -hmm. I really do because they are readers. Yeah. You know what? Uh, the, the reactions we get from kids um, uh, the few who have read the book love the illustrations. Rosalie mm -hmm. K. Fry illustrated herself and they're beautiful little line drawings. And we use some of them, you know, you'll see them in the movie. Um, the youngest kids, when they either read or are told the story, um, and especially when they say the movie, uh, they say uh, they should have took better care of that baby. <laughs> you know, <they're> <laughs> like, well, that could happen to me, you know. <laughs> um, and what we it was an interesting phenomenon when we actually showed it, which was adults liked it, little kids liked it, and teenagers would grudgingly say if they were dragged along, yeah, it was okay. You know, <laughs> and later on they might say, oh, I loved that movie when I was a kid, but then they forget that they it was really not their speed when they were <laughs> 14 years old. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I do think that. Um, that that reading thing, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I do in the movie, you might have noticed, is uh, it's also about oral tradition and storytelling. So there are three stories that are flashback stories that are told. Um, you know, one is just the grandfather just telling a story. Uh, one is the grandfather starting a story, and every once in his voice will come through, but you're you're seeing it lived out in the past. Um, and then one of them is just, he, he cuts off and then 
it's without dialogue and it's just you know visuals to to show the baby being stolen away um and that that partly comes from me associating kids literature with being read to um you know i read when i was pretty young i kind of figured it out and everything like that but there was nothing as good um as somebody with a good voice reading to you where you could just kind of sit there and make the pictures in your head um, mm -hmm. while somebody told you the story can i ask one question about casting mm -hmm. um terrific faces in this movie boy did i love looking at these faces how long did it take to find Fiona? How long was that process? She is that so was about three weeks. That was our big worry. You know, if you go into a movie, um, you know, uh, where a kid is the lead and you don't have your kid yet, and you've already gone to the country and started to to spend some money, there's a a, a Portuguese you know phrase that said "God laughs." And for a while we thought, oh boy, it's a, you know, we kept talking to Roz Hubbard, who was, you know, one of our casting people. She went on, there was kind of the, the equivalent of a Johnny Carson show in Ireland at that time, this guy Des. And she, she had been on before, I guess, for some other bigger, you know, adult movie she'd cast. And she said, we're looking for this girl. I want everybody in Ireland to, to you know, think, and she has to be, you know, between these ages. And this is the type of girl she is. And um, Jenny's mother watched the show and she said, she's talking about my kid. And she walked into her bedroom, looked at her and said, yeah, that's my kid. <laughs> so uh, Roz saw a thousand, at least a thousand kids. She said uh, probably 800 of them were seriously too old or mm. too young um her first question was always are you married you know and they would <laughs> laugh to get them you know uh and you know she she understood something that I've, I've 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 worked with a lot of kids um reading is one thing being able to act and be the person is another so she always added a little bit of play acting to it because sometimes kids are very good actors but they're not very good readers and that's true of adults too <laughs> um they, you know there there are some very famous actors who are dyslexic, who when they were younger actors and went in for um, uh, a part would have a friend do lines with them. So really they've, they've memorized the part and they're just pretending to read while they're doing the audition. So she saw about a thousand kids. We had two possibilities. Jenny was shy and um, I did the scene where she, she calls out to the seals and I just kept moving further and further away from her. We luckily were doing it in a fairly big room until I was just about in the hallway. And I kept saying, the seals can't hear you, Jenny. And and just the, the, the effort of shouting that loud started to bring the emotion out from her as Jenny or as the character who knew. But uh, the nice thing is um, she was just a wonderful kid uh she learned the name of everybody on the cast and crew um everybody you know you hear these nightmares about kid actors um everybody looked forward to the days when she was working um her stand-in who was a little girl who kind of looked like her and was the same height um to to stand in while you know we were setting up shots uh was a little girl named fiona and they became really good buddies and would run around and do somersaults on the beach and saying lipstick on my collar and things like that um, while they were waiting for the movie to start happening again. Um, so it was quite a search and we just got lucky. You don't always get lucky. Um, her parents were great. They had jobs and so they they came to visit a couple times. So she, you know, we had for both of the kids, we had, you know, kind of chaperones to help them through things. Uh, and the Irish are are, they love their kids. They have a lot of them. Uh, and they're not indulgent. They expect their children to be able to talk to adults and to do what they're supposed to do. And so we never had that problem of worrying the kids were going to get too much adult attention and get bratty. They remembered they were kids and they were there when they were doing a job, they were doing a job. 
And when they were playing, they were playing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Colin, who's next? Susan Nelson is up next. Okay. Hi. Thanks a lot for being here, Mr. Sales. Um, I thought getting back to the child actor um, issue, uh, I thought it was terrific that, that they weren't acting like child actors. They were acting like real children. And to me, that spoils a lot of movies when mm -hmm. you have children that are actually trying to act, to uh, be a little bit more precocious than they really are. So <clears throat> that's what kind of brought this this film um, to reality for me is I could identify with the children and I could uh, understand um, their reactions. Um, I, I was wondering a couple of questions. One is the evacuation from Roninish. Um, is that because of the war or because uh, economics or the trouble? Usually, it's economics. Uh, they did. They did. Uh, the British did evacuate. Um, you know, some islands, um, and the Nazis actually took over a couple British islands, and 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 you know the the residents who didn't get out were were under the thumb of the Nazis for the. This, you know, the duration of the war. Um, but in Ireland and Scotland, it was mostly economics that um, the the people who've been living there, they, you know, the boat that comes and supplies them or their own boats, they're just not enough people to make a go of it. And so there's this point where the, the people who run the boat just say, we're not coming anymore. There's a wonderful... Um, uh, movie um, called, I think it's called The Edge of the World, uh, a Scots movie that's about that very thing, about, about the, the, the week that the people have to, you know, get off the island and the people who don't want to go and a few of them actually stay behind and don't do too well because they stay behind. Um, the, the thing about the, 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 the kids not acting like kids, uh, some of that is... Uh, the more you can get them um, into a situation that is a familiar situation. So obviously they're in a different time period than they live in, uh, but kids understand arguments. They understand unfairness and you know protesting when they think something is unfair. Um, they understand having secrets from adults. Um, and then whenever we could, we gave them physical things to do and we said, you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to learn how to tie these knots. You're going to have to lift these things. You're going to have to get up on these ladder. You know, we'd be spotting it so they were safe. Um, so the only the only time that um, Jenny had a hard time, there's there's a in part of one of the montages, uh, they're cutting turf, uh, which is peat. And when peat is raw and is coming out of the bog, it's really heavy. Um, and it's really slimy and you can kind of see her holding this stuff like, oh my God, I hope this shot is over very quickly. Um, but she's, she's a kid who hasn't done that before. And I said, don't pretend that you've done something that you haven't. These are all things that you've seen adults do. And now you're basically having to act like adults and get this thing done. So you know, it, it helps any actor to find the reality within something. And, and so a lot of what I try to do with, with new actors, I don't like to call them non-actors, um, is to help them find that reality, sometimes just by supplying it. Um, there's a shot where uh, um, Jenny and her cousin are, are out in a rowboat with uh, Mick Lally, the actor who plays the grandfather. And um, Haskell, after about two takes, said, you know, I, I thought it was, I had the wrong filter in, but Jenny is looking green. <laughs> and and I, I said, Jenny, are you okay? And she went, and I said, okay, okay. Uh, but we've got your lines. We got your angle. Uh, guys, is it all right if Jenny goes in? So we took Jenny ashore and we did one more take toward uh, her cousin and uh, Richard and, he started looking green 
And we said, you okay, Richard? And he said, eh. and so we said, uh, okay. Mick, do you think you could do your part of the scene and we'll just throw you the lines from the script supervisor? And he said, ah, sure. And he was a veteran TV and movie actor. He was in one of their, their you know, most beloved nighttime series. And uh, so he ended up doing the scene with an empty boat basically and just turning when we shot him a line from the, the, the camera boat. Um, so yeah, even seasickness, um, you're living the part. All right. Okay, Colin, who's next? John Kuntz, you had your hand up a minute ago. Um, if you had a question, I wanted to give you a chance uh, to ask. Well, <clears throat> my questions are kind of uh, drifting away from the general conversation, but I'll ask them anyway. <clears throat> uh, there were a, well, there were three things that I really was struck by. One of them is that I think you have a great sense of humor, and uh, I've always enjoyed it. It's, it's very strong in your writing, and I thought that was a really fun scene at the beginning where the grandmother kind of uh, snorts that the grandfather is super superstitious man, and then she turns to the fire, makes the sign of the cross, and makes a prayer, uh, which I thought you were just showing two different forms of uh, superstition in the mm -hmm. uh, movie, and I got a big kick out of that. Um, uh, was that your intention when you uh, when you uh, crafted yeah, that? Scene? I mean, you know, there the, the, there is humor, you know, there the, there is humor in the world, and so you know, it it, it it's hard to leave it out of a movie, um, you know, and that's something that you you find in a lot of countries uh, where religion has has often been syncretic, so the old beliefs and the official religion kind of coexist sometimes more comfortably or sometimes less comfortably. Um, and that um, one person's version of superstition uh, may just not include the things that they believe, um, which they say, well, there, there, there's science behind that or, or well, that's, that, that's true. Um, and, and that blessing is something that you'll still see older Irish people do because they, they grew up with it. Um, I was raised Catholic and I still crossed myself or feel like I should, you know, not before every foul shot in a basketball game, but you know, it 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 gets ingrained. Uh -huh. um, my other my other you know favorite bit, and this was not in the book, was the her her dark cousin, who's the one who's kind of cracked, and uh, she sees him fishing with his bare hand, and at one point, you know, she says, you know, that they've. They've stolen Jamie away. And he said, well, they haven't stolen away. He's just with a, a different part of the family. Um, there are names in Ireland and names in Scotland. Uh, if you're a Keneally or a Kane, K-A-N-E, um, people might say, oh, that's a Selkie name. Those are the dark people. Um, and so they, you know, there is that lingering bit of, of kind of magical realist folklore that there are certain people who, if you look back far enough, there's going to be a seal in the family tree. Uh, <clears throat> there was an, another scene. I, I, I've seen a lot of your movies, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I thought in your early in your career, you could be sort of a semi-documentarian. Uh, there was a real strong bent toward realism, I think, in your movies. And th this is uh, a departure from that. And there was a scene that I thought was just, I, I watched it several times. I just thought it was absolutely lovely where the, um, this, this, it starts with the sky and you see the stars in the sky and then the camera pans back. And I guess this the pane of the window and the stars become a little bit um, uh, murky. And then it pans across the room into her uh, lying in bed. And then she gets up again, another pan, and looks out the window and sees the flame burning, uh, a fire burning off in the distance. I just thought that was an extraordinary shot. Was that a very difficult one to to make, or did it just happen? Uh, it, well, this is so far before CGI or any of those other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. These are all in-camera effects. So the stars are basically a great big 
piece of blue material with holes punched in it and a light behind it. Um, and you, you know that it's going to, you know, in black and white, it might look okay, but in color, it's going to look very, very kind of fairy tale. Um, if you've ever seen, oh God, what's the name of the movie? Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, but, but I felt like in this particular story, there was room for that. The same thing with the fire on the island. There's a couple <laughs> other places where it's, it's very clearly, okay, we're telling you a story here, or this is the way this girl is imagining things. And, and she's just a 10 year old kid. Um, but, uh, uh, what's the what's the one with Robert Mitchum and he's going love and hate? Um, Night of the Hunter. Yeah, Night yeah. of the Hunter. Charles Lawton directed it. Yeah, it, you know, which is a wonderful movie. You guys should do it sometimes. And it's it starts with Lillian Gish kind of telling a story, like she's telling a story to a bunch of little kids, and there's some really scary, gritty stuff in it. But when they go down the river, it's this magical thing that's so clearly done in a studio um, and on a, on purpose, you know, it's a kid's story and it's a, it's kind of a kid's horror story. Um, uh, and, and occasionally it will break out of that, but then it goes back and to kind of the way the kids would imagine that story. Uh, I just have a couple more what, what, a comment. I, I thought the sound was really extraordinary. This sense of wetness, mm -hmm. uh, you, you conveyed that your sound man, whoever it was, I noticed there were a bunch of people involved with the sound, but that sound really uh, added a kind of tactile dimension to the to the movie, making you feel like you know you were really in this uh, aquatic uh, world. Yeah, you 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 know the 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 soundtrack is as important as anything else. You know, Mason Daring, who did the music, was was mentioned earlier. Uh, one of my favorite. Um, scenes as far as the work of the sound department is um, there's kind of a dream that she has and you see these crabs moving yeah, yeah. and the sound that the sound department gave them because the, the, the crabs didn't make that much noise <laughs> um, but we added some kind of scuttling noises to it and then Mason had um, his uh, violin players play on the strings that are below the capo and, and it makes this very kind of scratchy you know electric kind of noise. Um, it, it, it's part of the storytelling. And, you know, the, when people ask me the difference between, you know, writing a book, because they write novels as well, and, and, and making a movie, one of them is that in a book, uh, you can get people to kind of see and feel and smell, but it all has to go through your brain first. And then you interpret those words. And if they're strong enough, you, you, you can feel these emotions and maybe right. even smell something. In a movie, there's stuff that goes straight to your gut, then can go through your head. And the soundtrack is one of those. It, it just, sometimes you, you don't even notice that, oh, there is music, I, you know, or all of a sudden, oh my God, where did the music go? You know, and you realize that your gut is clenched because somebody's done something to you, but it didn't go through your head first. And John, the last question John, I have, John, is... John, let me interrupt you for just a moment. We'll come back to you, but we got some other people that oh, are okay. waiting. We'll we'll come back around to you. Um, Thanks Bill, for understanding. Bill. Yeah, Bill is up next. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, John Sales, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is such a treat uh, having you here. Uh, I uh, really enjoyed this film. I I, I love the fact that it. Uh, is a story about storytelling mm -hmm. and the oral, oral tradition and uh, uh, the fact that um, uh, I really felt like we were placed in 1940s Northwest Ireland, the workaday world of people that lived next to the land and the sea and how realistic it was. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I felt like the film did such a nice job of melding that feeling of magical realism, that mythology in it. And it seemed like it was just so matter of fact. It's like, well, that's that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, wonderful. And um, uh, I want to share the sentiments of a couple of earlier people, um, Ed and Jan, talking about the score and the dialogue. 
uh, love the score. Uh, it fit perfectly. And uh, uh, so many beautiful lines in the dialogue. One of my questions is, um, uh, was the dialogue completely written or did you do any improv with it? Uh, the the other question I have is that um, uh, I love the uh, um, Haskell Wexler's work in this and the cinematography. Uh, it's been 20 years since my wife and I went to Ireland and it made me want to immediately go back. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, you could just feel uh, the landscape so well. And, and as you were talking about earlier, um, all these little beautiful in-camera things that were done without the use of CGI. And my other question is, uh, I know you'd worked a couple of times previously with Haskell Wexler, and uh, just wondering if you had any stories to relate about that, how you came to work with him and how you work with him. Does he do uh, a lot of this just sort of on his own, or, or do, is there a lot of a collaboration? Yeah, uh, Haskell is somebody who I, I uh, shot four movies for me. Um, I had talked to him once on the phone about a distributor. And uh, when we were on our, we were driving down to West Virginia to make Mate One. And uh, I was driving and Maggie was reading me a book called Masters of Light, which was interviews with, with great cinematographers. And halfway through reading Haskell's interview, she said, we've got to work with this guy. <laughs> he just sounds like he's into what we're into. And we called him up and uh, we left a message that we wanted him to, you know, we sent him the script and, and we want him to work. And uh, one day when we came in from a, a, a scout in uh, back to our hotel in Beckley, West Virginia, uh, the woman at the desk who had gotten to be a friend said, well, somebody named Hacksaw called and he, he said he was calling from his car. This is like the Haskell had every gadget before anybody else had it. And he says, whatever those people want, tell them the, the answer is yes. Um, so Haskell came down and we worked out a, a good method of working together. I basically would set up the shots. I storyboard quite a bit. Um, and then I would, I would, I would talk to Haskell very much about the mood of the scene. And, and, and it, it seems kind of artsy fartsy sometimes, but I'd say, I need this to be tense, or I, I need this to be tentative, or I, I, this, this goes from joy to gloom in the same shot. Um, you know, I, or, or, you know, I, I, I want these clothes to look like they've been, you know, washed in lye a thousand times. You know, and I want the whole town to look like it's been washed and lie, you know, because there's coal smoke here and they, you know, these are proud people and they've tried to scrub it off, but you can't get it all off. So a lot of what I would give Haskell were marching orders and, you know, and then he had to turn it into light. And not only did he have to turn it into light, he had to turn it into light sometimes within 20 minutes because the sun was moving around and stuff like that. Um, as far as ad libbing, uh, there's almost no ad living in any of my movies. I, you know, I, I, I try to work things out with the actors beforehand if they have a problem with saying a line or they they don't understand it or don't think their character would say it. So pretty much the actors are saying exactly what I wrote, even when it's in a foreign language that I don't speak, like Gaelic or Tagalog. You know, I'll have worked it out, you know, with whoever is doing the translation for me. And and the actors are learn it and you know and they find a way to say it the way their character would say it. Um, occasionally, um, I'll I'll you know have something that's been translated or I've written it in in my Spanish, and I'll say to an actor, "Okay, Puerto Ricanize this," and so there there might be inflection or a couple little changes you know, for that particular dialect, but pretty much people are, are saying the lines that, as they're written. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Thank Bill. You. And um, uh, who would you have next, Colin? Sue, Sue is up next. Okay, Sue. Okay, yeah, hi. Um, well, I, I watched this movie with my daughter who told me it was her, her and my granddaughter's favorite movie and they'd watched it several times and she couldn't wow. wait to see it again. Okay. <laughs> and I come back from a, <clears throat> 
pretty strong Irish background with a lot of stories and um, visited Ireland. And I think that um, the, that I agree with Bill. It was a, a beautiful storytelling. All the pieces fit the storytelling. Um, all of it fit those pieces of Ireland that I know that are like that. And um, it was very lyrical and it had this lilting quality. Um, there were a couple pieces that I really liked, but um, the the best one was, and I think it's the grandmother. Mm -hmm. the, she, um, you're coming along and, and all of a sudden we're now at the point of like, oh no, you know, this little boy is gonna be out in the storm and nobody's gonna believe these kids. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, it's a great moment where she goes, well, we know what we're going to do here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not reminding me of my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, they're, you know, those women had to work so hard. Um, they often had way too many children. Uh, sometimes all the children didn't make it. So they had to carry that for the rest of their lives. Um, and there was an incredible practical quality about them that it was okay no i'm not ready to do that i'm not ready to do that but when something really needed to be done right you know, we have to move we have to whatever it was okay let's go you know and and the men were very likely to step back and let them do it um <laughs> yeah. we shot the movie in donegal um ah. which, you know, ireland is that kind of flap you know so we we would actually often fly into belfast and then drive across Northern Ireland, back in the days when there were British soldiers with sniper guns, you know, aiming at you as you went through town. Um, and uh, Donegal at that time was considered neutral territory. So there was very little violence there. There were people from the north and south. There were a lot of German tourists. Um, and we were on, on the uh, far west coast near a town called Ross Beg. And one of the nice things about it is we were far enough from the airports that um, we got one airplane a day and it was a flight from uh, Dublin that was going all the way to Boston. So it was so high up, you didn't even hear it. You could see it at about the same time every day. So we never lost any shooting time to airplane noise, which you often do, you know, if you're trying to shoot something, you know, that's kind of rural and bucolic, you lose a lot of time to airplane time. Um, there were no hotels in the area, so we, uh, it was an area where in the summer, uh, uh, people often rented out to mostly German tourists, um, their, their home, homes and moved in with each other to make a little extra money because a fairly poor section of Ireland at that time is before the Irish tiger thing happened. Um, so our crew was scattered all over in these different houses. And our office and the place where we saw our dailies was the pub. Uh, so we had Guinness and popcorn every night and watched what we had shot two days earlier. So it was really a kind of ideal, you know, setting, you know, to, to make a movie very away from the matting crowd. Nice. Um, and, uh, you know, the weather was very changeable. So every day I would have on the schedule, here's the stormy, stormy weather shots. Here are the sunny shots. Here are the overcast shots. Right. We actually had so much sun for two weeks that we had to go inside because it looked too sunny to be Ireland on the coast. So I do, I do want to say I don't think there was a, a single false note throughout the whole thing, and okay. that one capped it really. Yeah. So thanks. Thank you, Sue. And it looks like we got Bill and Martha. Is that right, Colin? Next. That's right. That's the uh, last question we have. Okay. Bill, yeah. Hi, and uh, uh, thank you for joining us very much. Um, I was wondering how, um, with the the power of the dialogueless scene, with the father watching his son float away, how did you resist? uh not having the father return at the end of the movie to kind of um complete the Bill, um, you, you cut out a little toward the yeah end, I, I think i understand I, the question okay um yeah we meet the father um and he's you know he's probably it, it's probably starting in glasgow where a lot of irish without work went to work in factories um 
he's at a pub, he's had a few, He's kind, and his wife has died. He's kind of a defeated man. Um, he's not the story. You know, the, the, the little girl has bonded with his, her grandparents. He's never going back to that island. You know, if he goes back, it's just to look at his wife's grave and all these, this heartbreak. Um, so, you know, finally, I just felt like that would have been intrusive to bring him back at that point when he's been such a small character um and 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 such a down character uh it seemed a little disney to bring him back um you know and and you know this is this is for you know better or worse it's not a disney movie yeah thanks bill uh it looks like colin mm -hmm. we have debbie and then we're going to get back to john Koontz, and then we're going to do some recommendations oh and i so think we have debbie. uh Debbie, yeah. Debbie and then another Deb, I think, after that. Hi, Deb. Okay. Hi, uh, Mr. Sales. Thank you for being here. This is fantastic. Um, I love the film. Thanks. Now I, I've visited Ireland once. Now I want to go back yeah. <laughs> so much. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask was, um, I wanted to ask, how long did it take, given the patience you had to exercise with the seals, the children, of course, require some sort of handling. Um, how long did it take simply to film everything? I think we had seven weeks, which is not very long for a Hollywood movie. That's nothing. But we were very well planned. Uh, Haskell Wexler is a great cinematographer. I always talk about he had he had one of the, the best um, talent to speed ratios. So if you told him he had 20 minutes and make it look as good as you can, he might say, well, it doesn't look great. But then when you looked at it, it looks great to me. Um, the, uh, the kids were very, very good. So they really didn't cost us any time that, that adult actors wouldn't have. Um, and because I had scheduled things so that we, we always had something we could shoot in any weather, uh, we never lost any time because of weather. Um, the, the storms would come in and they might last an hour and you'd go in the, in the set, in the huts and you'd wait them out and then you'd come out and it's still overcast. Well, we can shoot in overcast. It's Ireland. It's, it's overcast a lot. <laughs> so, so, you know, we were very well planned and we had a very, very good crew. Um, and, uh, it's not a long, long movie cause I wanted it for, you know, a kid's attention span. So, you know, it's not like you're shooting a two and a half hours worth of material. Um, and then, as I said, every every Saturday, we did nothing but animals. Um, the seagulls were the most difficult to work with. Uh, seagulls, if, if they're, you know, they only are motivated by food and they have very small bellies. And so if they get a couple good bites, they're done for the day and we only had two <laughs> seals. So they were a little frustrating to work with. Um, the seals were always fun, even though it took some time to, to get with what they were doing. Um, and, and basically at the end of the movie, um, those three seals were ready to, to, to rock. And so uh, they took them back to set. Skegness, gave them a week of, of uh, homework, catching fish in their big tank. and let them out into the sea. Um, hmm. So that's the only movie they've been in, as far as I know. <laughs> wow. I, I just want to add that the part with the grandfather telling the story and the sound effects mm -hmm. really, at, at, at some point, it, it was like listening to it almost on a radio show. I almost felt like I could close my eyes and see it. Yeah. Well, first of all, he's, He's a very, very good actor, um, and he uh, he understands that kind of storytelling. Um, there, there's a long tradition of, you know, especially in 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 Irish, of at a Cayley, you'd tell the old guy, oh, oh, tell the story about this, and he might go for an hour, and never quite tell the story the same way. And people have heard it before, but they're such good storytellers that you can hear the seagulls, you can hear the water, 
you know, all those details come in and you, you, you can close your eyes. Um, you know, there's just a fire for firelight anyway. So I wanted that feeling with him and, and Mick Lally, uh, was, was the actor, um, really understood it. You know, he understood that when he had the forum, you know, whatever I was going to do with a cutting later on, uh, he had to tell that story. So it carried its own weight. Was it the, was the cutting easy or? Um, it with was Haskell Wesker. Some of it was tricky. Some of the steel seal stuff was tricky. We um, we hired a guy who was a nature photographer um, because there weren't too many real seals where we were shooting, and he went um, to a, a, a little bunch of rocks that at low tide come up near the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and uh, went a zodiac, and we hired him for three days. And every day, you know, he'd putter around the thing what the seals would haul themselves out. Uh, and every day, as happens, he could get a little closer and use a little wider lens. And I just gave him a shopping list of, here's what I wanna see the seals doing. So I was often cutting wild seals with our semi-tame seals, with animatronic seals. And, um, you know, that was fun, but that was the trickiest cutting. The rest of it was pretty easy. Um, you know, it was just good actors and however you set up the camera move or whatever. Um, getting Jamie, the, the little boy who, who, who played him, he was actually, um, a redheaded kid and we dyed his hair black. So he looked like one of the seal people. Um, and he just, he really understood playing games. So we had, we had an Australian friend of ours and, and she was a production assistant. And she would just play with him and be on a walkie talkie. And she'd say, I think um, uh, you better get to Jamie now uh, or he's going to need a nap, <laughs> you know? And so we'd bring him and he'd do his bit and we'd always make it a game. And he loved <laughs> running away and he loved being naked and he loved hiding and all that kind of stuff. And so it was kind of natural behavior for him. Uh, the scene where he comes ashore in his little cradle boat, which we still have, um, was the only time he ever touched that uh, cold North Atlantic water. Um, and we weren't getting him back into that boat after that. <laughs> yeah, he took one step, <laughs> fell in, and that was it. You know, But luckily, we've gotten all of our, our footage on that um, before he decided uh, he wasn't a diver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you so very much. Thank you, Debbie. Um, time for two more questions. We have um, Deb DC who has their hand up and then Gregory. And those are going to be our last two questions. For me. And I told John I would loop him back in. So we, okay. we do want to, as much as we love having Mr. Sales here, I know he doesn't have all night to stay with us. But so let's do those three and then we'll do some recommendations and wrap it up. Sounds good. So um, I just thought the film, of course, was so enchanting and it made me feel like I was in the child's world again. And one of the things that struck me was how people keep telling Fiona not to tell specific things to other specific people. Or, or they'll tell Fiona, don't believe that thing that that specific person just told you. Uh, like the grandfather saying not to mention Jamie to the grandmother, or the cousin saying not to mention renovating the, the home on Roninish. And it was just striking the way that Fiona then has to figure out, well, what should she believe? What shouldn't she tell people? And mm -hmm. I, I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, families are full of secrets. And, uh, you know, when, you, when, you, when, when you're a kid and you know a little bit of them, uh, very often what you get is you don't know what you're talking about just don't mention it. You know, that's going to hurt your grandparents' feelings or that's going to, you know, that's going to cause trouble or whatever. So kids are always getting that. Uh, we started off with that kid's point of view. When you see Fiona go into the pub at the beginning to talk to her father, we kept the camera at her level. Um, so, you, the, you know, it's kind of like the Peanuts comic strip. If you see an adult, you just see them up, out, up to the knees and you don't need to see the rest of them. You understand this is a kid's world. And a lot of the movie is shot from that level. Uh, Jenny wasn't particularly tall, so it, it's pretty low, um, you know. And then sometimes 
when she's not in the shot, it's her imagination. And so you're 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 shooting it not in a documentary way, but as a kid hearing that story or imagining that story might see it in their head. Um, you know, it's it, a lot of there's a lot of good movies that are are made from a kid's point of view, and it, and a lot of good short stories and, and novels. You know, because it's a it's a very particular way of seeing the world. And as an adult, or even as an older kid, you can sometimes say, oh, that's what's going on. And the kid doesn't know it yet. All right, thank you, Dee. And we're gonna give Gregory the last word before we get into recommendations, Gregory. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, um, this film really spoke to me. My, um, my grandmother grew up on the Southwest coast of Ireland in County Clare. As a child, she would regale me with the stories about the little people and the the, the fairies and the the cry of the banshee, and um, and it was fascinating and, and you know, compelling. My question is, what with your with the Irish crew and, and and the locals in the pub, did anyone share any stories like that with you or want to you know um, you know um, um, you know any share any other stories with you? You know, it's interesting. Uh, this is a movie that has never been distributed. Um, what we found while we were shooting there is that um, people are, um, they're friendly to tourists. It's part of how they make money. Um, they're friendly people, but um, they really don't want to live in the past. And so only the oldest people will say, oh yeah, I used to know a story about that. Yeah. Um, so when the movie was shown in Ireland, it was, oh, well, that's a good movie for, 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 for people outside, but we're not interested in that stuff anymore. Um, that's changed a bit. So, you know, people have seen, Irish people have seen it since then. So, oh, I love that actor or whatever. And, you know, they think the movie making is good, but um, it's, it's definitely not the, the Ireland that they wanted to, you know, have go out and represent them in the world at that time. Yeah. And what was interesting, though, is is that having English, Northern Irish and Irish um, Republic uh, crew, uh, they never talked about politics. <laughs> they they talked about sports a lot um, and movies a lot. But um, politics, you know, the troubles were still basically going on then. And people just stayed away from them. Okay, thank you, Greg. Well, uh, John, we can't thank you enough. This was such a wonderful film and such a wonderful experience having you here to share your thoughts and your stories and the, the behind the scenes things with the film, how it got put together. We really, really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, before you go though, and if you wanna hang around for the rest of the recommendations, that would be fine. We typically do recommendations at the end and sometimes those are films like the one that we just discussed, but they don't have to be. So I'm just going to ask you, is there any film that you think that we should, I know you mentioned Night of the Hunter, a mm -hmm. film that we should all see, whether it was uh, something that maybe you've seen recently or one of your favorites or anything? You know, my two favorites that I think are worth talking about are um, uh, Yojimbo. Mm. And uh, I'm so bad at uh, names now. Um, what's the um, uh, Humphrey Bogart film set in, in Mexico where they're, uh, they're gold mining? Oh, Sierra Madre? Treasure, yeah, treasure. It's treasure of the Sierra Madre. Right. I think those are just terrific right. movies. You know, um, you know, both kind of the height of studio mo movies in their own countries. Um, and they're just movies that hold up for me, you know, sometimes you see a movie again after a bunch of years and something's embarrassing or it's not as good as you remembered it. But, um, you know, th those two really are, are, I think, worth seeing again and talking about. Um, okay. I'm going to leave you all now. Thank you. John, thank you again so much. And have, have fun with your series. Bye now. All right. Thanks again. 
Okay. Well, that was just, that was a blast. Uh, I hope I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as as I did. It was wonderful. Well, let, let's yep. go with the recommendations. Uh, Colin, who's our first recommendation after John? Um, Jan had uh, his hand up next. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just got one recommendation. It's a movie I discovered a few years ago only because I checked out one of those YouTube videos in the Criterion Closet where filmmakers go into the closet and recommend some of the releases. It's called The Organizer. It's an Italian movie, 1963, about a strike in a textile factory. And the person who recommended it was John Sales. It'll really <laughs> surprise you. You may be able to see it on the channel, but it is worth buying. And it's at a very good price right now if you are into physical media. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Jan. Uh, it is on the channel, and I've had it in my queue for a little while. I'm excited. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, Jeff is up next. Well, I sort of hoped that John would stay on because I was going to plug one of his. Uh, um, I have two. One is uh, is uh, John's uh, Lone Star, which uh, the 90s were a great, great decade for movies. To me, that was the best movie of the, of the 90s, a really brilliant movie. Um, the other one is one, uh, a fairly recent one, which I saw, which immediately made me think of, of this, of Ron Inish, and that was uh, The Banshees of Inish Aaron, uh, which literally could have almost been filmed on the same island. It's just a same, same sort of thing, and, and, and uh, fueled by two great, great performances by two great actors in, in Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. So it's a little bit, little bit funny, a little bit sad, a little bit horrifying, but just, just really a brilliant movie. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Susan. Susan Nelson. Yeah. Um, I'd like to recommend uh, what my favorite John Sayles movie, Eight Men Out, in which he also acts as Ring Lardner, the sports writer. And I think I'm going to go search that out and see if I can't um, watch it again. And also, um, I'm interested in some of his later films, the specifically the one that was um, filmed in the Philippines, um, which I'm gonna search out also. Um, another recommendation I have is a movie that is about an orphan or a, a child who has um, lost their mother and whose father is essentially worthless called Careful He Might Hear You an Australian movie with uh, Wendy Hughes, which is a, a lovely little movie, very, very sad. And um, you might want to, I think that might be on Criterion, although I'm not totally sure. Susan, I saw it pop up recently somewhere and I think you might be right. I think it, I think it could be Criterion. Yeah. Okay, um, who's next? John, John Coons is up next. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to, recommend uh, a book of which John Sales wrote. It's a collection of short stories called The Anarchist Convention. Uh, it's really quite funny. The title itself tells you you're dealing with a, the idea of anarchists actually getting together and having a convention is uh, uh, humorous in itself. That's an early book. It might be his first book. Uh, also, in terms of storytelling, there's a um, play that uh, versions of which are available on YouTube called The Weir by Connor McPherson. And it's set in an Irish pub and it's all storytelling and uh, incredibly moving. Uh, so if you get a chance to watch that. And then finally, I think I've recommended this before, but it's a movie made around the same time as the movie we watch called Into the West, dealing with children. Gabriel Byrne is the lead actor, and it's a fantastic movie. Jim Sheridan wrote the script. Mike Newell directed it. Really, really good movie. 1992. So it's around the same period as uh, Rowan Ennish. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bill is up next. Uh, yes, yeah, the old, old line about uh, great thing, uh, great minds think alike. Uh, uh, Jeff stole my thunder on, on Lone Star and Ennish Sharon. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, um, I think it might be Sale's earliest movie. I think it was his breakthrough movie. Uh, I'm still very fond of um, The Return of the Secaucus 7. 
And uh, even though it's uh, it was obviously filmed on a fairly low budget, and it's a little raw around the edges, but in a lot of ways, I liked it better than the uh, the big budget sort of semi remake of it, the big chill that happened a few years later. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Uh, I like that a lot as well. And Jan. Kudos, Andy, for arranging this. It was really enjoyable. Um, my recommendation is a 1983 movie. Uh, it was I just it came back to me watching our movie tonight called Local Hero. This time it's uh, filmed in Scotland. Uh, Peter Rieger, Peter Capaldi, who went on to become Doctor Who, and Burt Lancaster in later years. Um, a Houston executive sent to Scotland to negotiate a refinery and um, just becomes captivated by the Scottish world. Very similar in the mood and the misty fog and the ocean. It's a great movie. It is a great movie, Jay. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I showed that at the library several years ago, but it's oh, it, okay. So I don't think I knew you then. So yeah, <laughs> good, good pick. Okay, who else do we have? Um, that looks like it's it for people that have their hand up for a recommendation. I'll add one real quick. Mm -hmm. um, if you want a very different take on superstition and island life, um, there's a movie, an Icelandic Danish movie called Godland. Um, that came out recently about a priest, uh, a missionary who, a uh, Danish missionary who ventures to Iceland in the late 1800s, I think, um, to build a church deep in the wilderness and gets stranger and darker and uh, weirder as it, as it goes along. Um, very atmospheric. Landscape plays a huge, huge part in the movie. Um, it's got, you know, when I watch this one, it, they're very, very different movies, but um, very interesting um, to see the kind of different takes on isolation and island life. Um, so that's one to, to check out. Um, and Laura has her hand up. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to say if you're interested in any more um, just fun, kind of feel good Irish films, um, Waking Ned Divine is a really great one. Um, and then also if you like um, like Irish music at all, um, The Boys and Girl from County Clare is a super fun uh, one about two brothers that um, are competing against each other in this music competition. Thank you, Laura. Laura, it's great to hear from you. Um, I haven't I haven't talked to Laura or seen Laura in, in, in such a long time. Laura, tell us just a little bit about your Irish experience. Uh, so I was living over there studying at um, Trinity College in Dublin. And I actually took one of our required courses was an Irish film course. So um, I can send you the list, Andy, if you'd like, of all the films that we were required to watch. Um, a lot of them were um, a little more on the kind of sad, depressing side, but there was a couple of comedies that they threw in there. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I loved living there. I will say that the weather is um, can be very dreary, especially in the winter, um, because it like you get like about four hours of sunlight. Mm. Um, but during the summer, it's lovely and. Um, one thing that he mentioned was that there was a certain perception that the Irish people didn't want portrayed in the film because everybody's like, oh, it's Ireland, it's just green and there's leprechauns everywhere. And a lot of um, my classmates who are Irish would say, no, you know, we have tech centers we are a major player in the world now. We're not just these country people, but yet you also go out into the country and it's just as green as what it looks. And, mm. you know, it's beautiful, um, but the people are amazingly friendly. Um, I just love it there and I can't wait to go back. <laughs> uh, I know, I know you had a great time there. Well, Laura, we'll we'll catch up sometime, but please do send yeah. me that that list. I would love to I would love to do that. 
All so right, you're going to get well, the director next time, right, Andy? Right, that, uh, exactly. That how this every, works every, every director, even the ones that aren't alive anymore, yeah. you can't get them. Yeah. Scor Scorsese's next. Scorsese's next. Scorsese. Yeah. <laughs> I'll help you with that one. Hitchcock. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hitchcock is going to be great. He's going to have a cameo. That's what he's going to do. All right, well, thank you all so much for being a part of this tonight, for, for watching this movie. And I think I think we all enjoyed the film, and, and I hope we all enjoyed John being with us as well. So everybody have a great September, which we just kicked off today. Take care and watch a lot of great movies. And I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.